So today we'll talk about attacks on Format Preserved Encryption, or FPE. So FPE is widely used in practice to encrypt credit card numbers or fields in legacy databases. So in those uh, legacy systems, the schemas mandate some certain format on the data. So if you use an ordinary encryption scheme to encrypt your data, then you would destroy the format and disrupt the legacy system. In contrast, under FBE, the server text will have the same format as the plain text. For example, if you encrypt a credit card number, the server text will also look like a credit card number. And thus, by retaining the format of data, FBE avoids disrupting legacy system. So definitionally, FPE is just a tweakable block cipher with a general message space DOM. In particular, an FPE scheme takes as input a key and a tweak to map a message in the domain DOM to a server text within the same domain. This mapping is deterministic, meaning that under the same key and tweak, if you keep encrypting the same message, you would end up with the same server text. So let me elaborate uh, the, why there's a need for tweaks via an application. So suppose that in a database, we encrypt the customer names together with their credit card numbers in one table. In another table, we store the transaction numbers together with the corresponding credit card numbers. If we combine these two tables, you can realize that John Doe made transactions one and two. And even if you FPE encrypt these two tables under the same key and tweak, the linking process can be done because FPE is deterministic. In contrast, if you FPE encrypt them with different tweaks, then you can still realize that transactions one and two were made under the same credit card number but there's no way to link that back to Chondo anymore. So by using Twix, you increase the security of FPE. Now, a particularly annoying challenge in designing FPE is that, unlike traditional block cipher, the domain here can be very small. In fact, there are applications in which the domain size is just 100. And this crucial point repeatedly leads to attacks that are exponential uh, running time, but still practical on small domains. You will see the, 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 those attacks in a couple of minutes, but before I get into that, let me uh, briefly go some of the real-world FPE schemes. So most important ones are these standards, FF1 and FF3, both based on Firestone networks. FF3 is currently suspended, due to a recent attack by Durak and Vordenay, but because the fix is pretty cheap, so it seems likely to get reinstated. There are several companies offering FPE products, such as Vortis or Veriphone, and most of them either use these standards or some closed Feisto variants. However, there are still non Feisto FPE solutions from the industry. For example, Protegity uses a scheme that they call DTP and claim better security than its standards. DTP largely follows uh, an ad hoc construction in the 90s. Cisco also proposed an FNR scheme, but to the best of our knowledge, it is not in use. FNR instead uh, is based on the non wrangle variants of Feisto. There have been so far two complementary attacks on the FPE schemes. All of them focus on these standards. The most recent one is by Durek and Vordenay, and by exploiting a bug in the RAF functions of FF3, they managed to recover the entire codebook. So this prompted NIST to temporarily suspend FF3. However, this stack is not applicable to a generic file structure and it is to easily fix without hurting performance by restricting the tweak space. 
In a different direction, uh, in, a prior paper, in my prior paper with Mihir Bulari and Stefano Tesoro, we show an, a message recovery attack uh, on a trajectory file store, which applies to both FF1 and FF3. This attack can recover just a single target message, but it shows some inherent weakness in NIST standards, it meaning that on a small domain, you need more routes to be a PSQ. The two attacks I just show are somewhat expensive. They are only practical on small domains. Moreover, it's still quite questionable about whether it's uh, practical to deploy them. For example, in the DB attack, the adversary needs to make several adaptive queries to an in encryption oracle, but in practice, it's kept uh, hard to mount some adaptivity. Moreover, uh, they need uh, several chosen messages per tweak, but uh, many companies prefer to encrypt not so many messages per tweak to increase the perceived security, and by doing so, they unwittingly defeat the DB attack. On the other hand, while the BHD attack uh, is not adaptive, and needs only three messages per tweak. It requires a very strong correlation between the known messages and the, the target. In particular, a known message must have the same right half as the target, but it's unclear how to enforce that in practice. Uh, the, none, the idea of none of these attacks seems applicable to FNR, although it's just another generalized file structure, which makes FNR cap an interesting alternative to these standards. However, today, I will show an attack on the theoretic file structure that applies to both FF1 and FF3, and the idea, uh, our idea actually can be recast to break FNR as well. Why our attack is somewhat uh, similar to the BHD attack, we need no correlation between the known messages and the targets. And by reducing the known messages, we can recover multiple targets uh, instead of just a single one. In addition, we only need just a moderate number of known messages per tweak, so it seems that our attack is quite uh, deployable. As the prior attacks, however, our attack is still quite expensive, so they are only practical on small domains. So here's a graphical illustration for the cost of our attack for FF1 and FF3, where cost is measured by the number of cell attacks per target. Our attack also highlights an interesting difference between the design of FF1 and FF3. So both of these schemes prefer to use balanced files whenever possible. So meaning that ideally, we want the left half and the right half to have the same size. But if the message length is odd, one half has to be bigger than the other. So in that case, for FF1, the right half is bigger than the left, and FF3 chooses to go the opposite direction. So at the first glance, this guy of uh, design choice appears innocuous. It, sh it shouldn't have security. But uh, in our attack, it appears that FF3's design choice is inferior. In particular, in uh, the odd domains for FF1, our attack has just roughly the same cost as the BSD attack, but for FF3, our attack is quite better than uh, BSD. So far, uh, as you've seen in previous slides, we have uh, known plain text attacks for FF1 and FFR, Three, that is practical on small domains. For the DTP scheme of protectivity, we can do even much better. We can even launch a cyber attacks only attack that is practical on any domain. In particular, if you want to recover an encrypted uh, credit card number, you need uh, roughly 600,000 cyber attacks to do that. In reality, it's even better because Protagative prefers to interpret a credit card number as a sixth one of alphanumeric characters. 
it, by doing so, the goal is to enlarge the domain to make attacks more expensive. That will be true if uh, you use FF1 or FF3, but for DTP, it only makes our attack 10 times better. So in particular, you now need only 53,000 cyber attacks to recover a credit card number. So now we have, I don't have time to talk about all of the attacks, so I will just discuss the FF1 and FF3 attack. But I will be happy to take uh, offline questions about them, the other one. So recall that our attack is a known plain text attack, meaning that we are given some random known messages, x1 to xt, together with their several attacks under q twix, t1 to tq. Our goal here is to recover all the unknown targets, Z1 to ZP, given just their cyber attacks under the same twigs as before. Now because FA is deterministic to rule out a trivial attacks, I will assume that the known messages and the targets are distinct. So before I get into the details of the attack, let me briefly recall a couple of things about Firestone networks. So in this picture, it's a four-round Firestone, but uh, we will consider a general R-round Firestone, where R is uh, 10 for FF1, and it is 8 for FF3. So the, the domain here is a product Zn times Zn, where Mn can be pretty small. So remember that there are applications where the product Mn is just 100. And because the domain is non-binary, so instead of a regular XR, we would consider a general group operator plus. Now the key idea in our attack is that under the, uh, when you encrypt using Faisal, it exhibits some certain bias. It dates back to a paper by Patarin in 1991 and was also exploited in a BST attack so in particular, suppose that we encrypt two distinct messages of the same right half. Let's call them L0, R0, and L0, R0. Now let's take the left half of the cell attacks and study the difference. So it turns out that the, this distribution will pick at the point L0 minus L0. The gap between the peak column and the other columns is so small, it's just a very small number delta to exploit directly. But if you have enough pairs of plain text of a text, you can amplify that. Let me now show you how to uh, use the bias to recover a, uh, a target Z. Now suppose that somehow by magic, I can select a known message X such that it has the same right half as the target Z. Of course, this is just wishful thinking, but I will show you how to realize this missing step later. And because it is a non plain text attack, we are given the cell attacks as usual. So if we find ourselves in this situation, we can recover the right half of the target trivially by looking at the right half of the known message X. To recover the left half, we will do some frequency analysis plotting a frequency histogram, and thanks to the distribution that I just showed you a couple of minutes later, uh, earlier, that's, if you use enough twigs, it's likely that only one column, uh, the peak column is likely to be the point left z minus left x. In particular, there's a certain threshold based on the bias delta and q, so that this is the only column exceeding that point. So by looking at the peak column of the histogram, you can recover the left half of the target. Now this is kind of nice, but uh, we still have to realize this missing gap. To fill in the gap, we will narrow down the set of known messages by selecting messages y1 to yn so that the right half covers the entire set zn. So because they cover everything, at least some way I must have the same right half as the target, but we don't know which one. But now, before we pinpoint the correct one, let's take a step backward 
and look at what we just done. The selection is not always possible because the known messages x1 to xt are random. So on the one hand, we need t to be small for efficiency. On the other hand, t needs to be big enough so that the selection is possible with high probability. So we, you need to pick a sweet spot here. So it turns out that this is just a well-known coupon collector problem where you, there are n types of coupon. So you go by t coupons at random and you hope to collect all the n types with high probability. So in the classical setting, the coupons will have truly random types. So you, you are recommended to buy about n log n coupons. But in our setting, the coupons are the right half of the known messages. Because these known messages are distinct, so each time you buy a coupon, it is slightly biased toward the new types that you never had. So the, the number of needed coupons is slightly smaller. So now, remember that we are given n messages, y1 to y n, and exactly one of them, we have the same right half as the target, z. But now we need to pinpoint that particular known message. In order to do that, for x, y, k, we plot the frequency histogram as before. If y, k happens to have the same right half as z, then, as before, there's only one column beyond the threshold. In contrast, if y k, k doesn't have the same right half as z, z, then it's likely that no column would ever surpass the, the threshold. So by looking at the histograms, you can pinpoint the correct no message of the same right half as the target. And that's that. Now, this attack is only possible if the tweak number Q is big enough. But how big is big enough? So here we have a lower bound for the recovery rates if you use Q tweaks and want to recover P targets. And here's the illustration for that bound when for FF1 and FF3 where you want to recover the entire code book. So we actually ran some experiments on FF3 and the empirical results uh, are even better than the theoretical analysis. Even if it's quite smaller values, Q than the suggested, uh, and the suggested we can have 100% recovery rates. Now, let's have a look at what we just done. So we are given some random no messages, and then we show how to recover all targets. But in reality, no messages might not be uniformly distributed. But we still want our attack to work in that particular case. Of course, if the distribution is not nice, it might be not possible to recover all targets, but we want to recover as many targets as possible. So, in fact, we can, can recover every target ZI as long as that target has a right half covered by some known messages. In order to do that, we will first tell the set of known messages to white y1 to ys of the distinct right half, such as the set of the right halves remains the same as before. Then, if you want to recover target zi, for every yk, you would use a frequency histogram to check if yk has the same right half as zi. If yes, you would recover zi as before. If you cannot find such yk, then you simply uh, announce that you failed to recover it. So in summary, today I've shown you some practical attacks on several FA schemes. To deal with them, if you happen to use FF1 or FF3 in tiny domains, you should use double encryption as suggested by ANSI. And for the DTP scheme, it is completely broken, so you should avoid it at all costs. That is, thank you. <laughs>